Hi guys, welcome to the intro into the skeletal system. Now this is attempt number two with the new camera. We're gonna see how this one pans out today. We made some changes. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Now the first thing to talk about here is classification of bones, of which you have about 206 named bones in the skeleton. Now there are more than 206 bones in the skeleton. It's just that 206 of them have physical names, okay? Now these are going to be divided into, into two groups. This is the axial skeleton. Uh, the axial skeleton is shown here, the central core of the body, uh, your skull, your vertebrae, your ribs, and then the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton being more concerned with the appendages of the body, if you will. Okay, so arms and legs and their associated girdles. Now, most of this, not all, most of this is initially formed from cartilage uh, as your fetal skeleton was initially formed from cartilage. Uh, so the first real place to get started here is a discussion of the cartilages. And you should be familiar with these at this stage regardless, but uh, there is hyaline cartilage. It uh, looks like this, very glassy, very smooth in its appearance. And hyaline cartilage is by far the most numerous format of cartilage in your body. Uh, you've got hyaline cartilage everywhere, man. So you've got hyaline cartilage between the joints in your in your body, from your toes to your uh, fingers, etc. Uh, your nose is hyaline cartilage. Your tracheal passages are hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage formed your um, growth plates that allowed you to get taller over time. Hyaline cartilage formed the majority of your fetal skeleton. This is super prevalent. Super prevalent. Uh, then there is, of course, elastic cartilage as seen here. Elastic cartilage is far more rare by comparison. It looks a lot like hyaline cartilage. It simply bears a lot of elastic fibers. And elastic cartilage is more or less confined to your ears and your epiglottis. And again, your epiglottis is a cartilaginous flap that kind of covers your tracheal passages uh, when you're eating food. So when I eat and I swallow, my tracheal passages are covered so no food debris or liquids can get down into my lungs. And then when I breathe, the epiglottis opens to allow for uh, air to get in. So elastic cartilage is very important. And then of course, last but not least, and still very important to the skeletal system is fiber cartilage. Fiber cartilage being that which makes up your intervertebral discs and uh, the meniscus in your knees, which is a secondary cartilage in your knees, and uh, what's called the pubic symphysis at the very front of the pelvis is also gonna be fi uh, fiber cartilage. Uh, fiber cartilage has like a gooey cartilaginous center and then a ring of fiber around the outside which makes it fibro cartilage. And this sort of shows the locations of all of these cartilages. You can see the epiglottis there, which we talked about in the ears are green for uh, elastic cartilage. You can see all of the blue here for Highland. You can see the fibro. It's just a nice graphic. All right, classification of bones by shape. All right, <clears throat> it's going to go something like this. There are long bones. There are short bones. There are flat bones. There are irregular bones. We, as humans, love putting things in little boxes. Okay? We like to be able to say, oh, that belongs in this category, or this belongs in that category. And it gets complicated, all right? It gets a little bit complicated. So let's just go over to here. Long bones tend to be longer than they are wide. Uh, your humerus is a long bone. Your femurs are long bones. But not just those, okay? Uh, you've got long bones in your fingers. Like these tiny little bones in your fingers are still longer than they are wide. They are long bones, okay? Uh, by comparison to short bones, which is what I'd like to do next, short bones tend to be kind of squarish. Uh, these are going to be like your carpals and your tarsals in your feet. So carpals in the hands, tarsals in the feet. And what these tend to be is like a, uh, a bone that has what's called compact bone around the outside, but its central core is completely spongy bone. And you'll see what that looks like here in just a second. So short bones are, are really variable. They, they, man, they can look very different. And they include, and this is very important, the sesamoid bones. Okay, sesamoid bones are those which are found within tendons or ligaments, like your, your patella. Your patella is a named sesamoid bone. Okay, it's a named sesamoid bone. Because you've got sesamoid bones all over the place, like in your thumb, for instance. Oh, yeah. So this is your thumb. You can see these two, two little round bones here. Those are sesamoid bones uh, found within tendons and or ligaments. Uh, then there are flat bones. Flat bones are <clears throat> flat. Okay, they're very flat. 
Uh, the perfect example of that is your sternum. Your sternum is the opportune flat bone. Uh, flat, sternum, flat, flat, flat. Skull bones, flat, okay? At least the cranial ones. I love my eyebrows here, by the way. Uh, and then, of course, there are the irregular bones, and irregular bones are the catch-all, okay? If it doesn't fit into the other categories, it's considered irregular. These vertebrae are considered irregular bones. Uh, some of the deeper bones in the skull are considered irregular bones. So we have long bones, including these are long bones. Uh, short bones, like those. Uh, we have the flat bones, like the sternum. And we have your regular bones, like the vertebrae, the pelvic bones, etc. All right. Uh, functions, of which there are several. Okay, there are a lot of different functions for the skeletal system. Uh, we will outline a few. Support. Holding the body up is very, very important when it comes to functions of the skeleton. Protection. Uh, your brain. Your brain is protected by your skull. Your heart is protected by your ribs, your lungs. Even your kidneys, to some degree, have protection from the skeleton. Uh, movement. So the fulcrum-like motion using muscles allows you to move around, using the bones as base points and connections. The skeleton is very important for movement. Mineral and growth factor storage. You gotta think of your skeleton almost like a bank for calcium. Calcium is just very important for the body. And if you have a, a excess, thunder, if you have too much or too little, major problems. So what will happen is if you have a lot of blood calcium, you'll store it away in the bones to get rid of it. And alternatively, if you have low blood calcium, you pull it out of the bones and put it back into the blood supply. It's no different from glycogen in the liver for sugar. If you don't have enough blood sugar, you pull glycogen out of the liver. If you have too much blood sugar, you put glycogen in the liver. Uh, the skeleton does the same thing for calcium and phosphate to a lesser degree. Uh, blood cell formation, or what's referred to as hematopoiesis, uh, this takes place wholly within the skeletal system. Your sternum houses lots of what we call bone marrow. Uh, the ends of your femurs house bone marrow. Your pelvis houses special bone marrow that allows for hematopoietic cell division, uh, i.e. a blood cell of all form, not just red blood cells, but blood cell formation. Your skeleton stores a large amount of fat, actually. Your femurs, the middle portion, boy, that thunders for real. The middle portions of your femurs, packed with triglycerides being fat storage. Uh, and then, of course, there is some hormone play to be dealt with here, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. Now, bones are organs. Okay, bones are organs. The definition of an organ is two or more different types of tissues working together towards a common goal. Ergo, your bones have bone tissue, your bones have nervous tissue inside of them, your bones have uh, various other connective tissues associated, like the outer coverings or dense regular. Uh, your bones have uh, all sorts of epithelium internally, lining their cavities, lining your blood vessels in the bones. I mean, you know, your bones have lots and lots of different tissues internally, and there are three different levels of structural organization. These are gross anatomy, microscopic anatomy, and then of course the chemical makeup of the bone itself. All right, gross anatomy. This is looking at bone textures. Now, bone texture is a balancing act between weight and strength. Okay, weight and strength. What you'll see is that uh, the outer portions of the bone, like this is a femur, are made up of this very thick and dense compact bone, all right? This is called compact bone. Very thick, very dense, super, super strong, but also quite heavy. I'm just gonna go look out the windows to make sure there's nothing bad happening. It's very nasty sounding outside. I feel like it always storms when I'm doing anatomy lectures. <clears throat> Where was I? Compact bone versus spongy bone. All right, so compact bone as seen here around the outside of this femur. It's very thick and very strong, but also quite heavy. Uh, whereas the spongy bone seen here, it's not spongy. It just looks like a sponge, okay? It's still quite hard. It just looks spongy in its appearance. In fact, it's quite hard. All of it together in unison is very, very hard. You couldn't break it with your hands, all right? Um, it just is very open, has a lot of empty space within it. Do I have another picture? Yeah, it's got a lot of empty space inside of there. Okay, there's just a lot of empty space. Now what this does is it still maintains strength, 
because it's very big. Like look at the, the diaphysis, this lower portion here of compact bone, it's very small in diameter. If you made all of this out of the same compact bone, it would just be so heavy, man. It will be so heavy. Your skeleton will be so heavy that it wouldn't be terribly efficient. So what do you do? You make the big ends of the bone where you have to have articulations and cartilage formation. You make those big ends uh, out of spongy bone and it makes the skeleton light. If you go back and look at uh, early hominid origins, the way our skeleton is set up is basically to be quite lightweight. Okay, we want to be able to run fast when we need to with our bipedal legs. Very rare in the animal kingdom. Uh, the idea is that our skeleton is set up to be uh, capable of moving very quickly. So having a good, lightweight, but still strong skeleton, very important. Man, I hope you guys can hear that thunder. It is crazy out there. Holy cow. You might see me duck and cover here in a minute. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Moving on. Let me say this. All right, trabeculae, these are referred to as trabecular cavities. Trabeculae is a fancy way of talking about spongy bone and the cavities therein, and the little interconnection pieces as being trabeculae. Um, and that's really all I want to say about that. I'm, I'm pretty happy. I will point out that bones have both an exterior and interior lining. These are called the periosteum and the endosteum. So you'll have periosteum around the outside of this bone and endosteum around the inside of the bone. Typically, periosteum is very, very thick and strong and fibrous, whereas endosteum is very thin and delicate. Okay? Um, and periosteum has other functions that we'll talk about soon, so you better be freaking friends with the concept of periosteum. Speaking of which, all right, um, the plate medullary cavities. All right, <clears throat> what we have here is a good general long bone. This is kind of like a, a humerus in your arm, so this portion up top here. And what we have is an epiphysis, an epiphysis, and a diaphysis. The diaphysis is the central shaft, all right? The diaphysis is the shaft. The epiphyses are the ends. There will be a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis. On my humerus, the proximal epiphysis is there, all right? Proximal epiphysis, distal epiphysis. Distal means further from the trunk of the body. Proximal means closer to the trunk of the body. So we have proximal and distal epiphyses. And in between this, if you look here of the skeleton, you can see this little line across there. That is what's referred to as an epiphyseal line. Okay, an epiphyseal line. It is a remnant. It is a scar left over from your growth plate once you became a fully formed adult. In the past, this would have been called an epiphyseal plate or what you would have called a growth plate made out of hyaline cartilage. Whereas now, in view of fully formed adult, it is an epiphyseal line, a scar left over where that growth plate was and then eventually developed into uh, a strong bony union. The epiphyses will be made out of spongy bone, the diaphysis will be primarily made out of compact bone, and the diaphysis will have a medullary cavity or a bone marrow cavity, a medullary cavity or a bone marrow cavity. Now, there will be bone marrow in here, but there are actually two types of bone marrow that we'll be talking about here in a little bit uh, that will come into play as we go further. Tell me I'm already on it. I'm not. All right, let's talk a little bit about the periosteum. So the periosteum of the bone is this outer covering, as you can see here. This is fibrous connective tissue, and what's important about this is the way that it's connected to the bone itself. The periosteum is connected to the bone via deep um, collagen fibers called the Sharpies fibers. So what you'll have is this, this covering, this, this covering on the bone called the periosteum, and then there are these Sharpies fibers that connect to the periosteum. They are continuous to the periosteum, and they penetrate in deeply to the bone and anchor themselves in place to hold the periosteum on. So the Sharpies fibers connect the bone to the periosteum. Very important. The Sharpies fibers are very strong and connect the incredibly tough periosteum to the bone, making them basically function as a single unit. Fibrous connective tissue containing osteogenic cells. Yeah, there's going to be bone growth cells there. Uh, this periosteum 
uh, carries with it, being that it's connective tissue, lots of blood vessels that then penetrate into the bone to uh, provide the bone with nutrition. Bones are super uh, venous. All these openings that you see here are just packed with blood vessels and nerves, and they are coming in initially from this periosteum. Yeah, now, where I'm going here is a conversation on how muscles and ligaments, being tendons and ligaments, connect to the bone. And what they connect to is the periosteum. The periosteum is very strongly connected to the bone, and tendons and ligaments connect very strongly to the periosteum. Very strongly indeed, actually. This is my hand, uh, and it's my hand, I think it's this one, doing this, basically, okay? You basically see me doing this. And it's this finger that we're looking at here, and let's see if this works. It obviously doesn't. What you see is a opening right there. What had happened is I crashed my bicycle. Okay, I used to bike all the time everywhere I went. I don't do that anymore, obviously. I have three kids. Uh, but this finger got bent backwards, and when it was bent backwards, rather than tearing the ligament, the ligament was so strongly connected to the periosteum which was so strongly connected to the bone that instead of tearing the ligament, it pulled the bone off where the ligament was connected. This is referred to as a volar plate fracture. It's pretty common, actually. Uh, and it actually pulled the bone away. So the ligament and the connection from the ligament to the bone was so strong that the weakest link in the chain was the bone itself. So it broke the bone instead of tearing the ligament. And that's pretty darned interesting. And good for me because that'll heal, whereas a torn ligament is Let's call it more complicated. All right, now then, let's talk about different types of bone marrow. Uh, there are two types of bone marrow. These are yellow marrow and red marrow. Now, yellow marrow is basically just fat, all right? Nothing fancy. Uh, when we eat food and there's fat in that food, we need to store that fat. One of the places that we store fat is in the bones, and that's yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow, by comparison, is the bone marrow that allows us to produce red blood cells and all other blood cells as well, okay? All blood cells come from red marrow. Now, early in your development, when you were like five or six years old, your skeleton was just packed with red marrow. Your marrow cavities were full of red marrow, but that is no longer the case. In fact, red bone marrow is very rare in your body today. You've got some in your sternum, you've got some in the heads of your femurs and your pelvis, but not much of anywhere else. In fact, if you look at this uh, very fresh human femoral head here, so it's the head of a femur that's been cut off, you can see this goofy yellow in the middle, that's yellow marrow, that's just fat. And then this red that's coating the trabecular cavities, that's red bone marrow. Now, why? Why do you not have much red bone marrow today? Let's think about my kids. Uh, my kid, like my youngest, is like a year old right now, and he'll like virtually double in size by the time he's two. Okay, he will be much, much bigger. When's the last time you doubled in size? I hope not any time recently. Uh, the concept is that as we are growing from being very small to getting uh, bigger, better terminology, uh, we are moving up in, in body volume quite quickly. And because our body volume is changing so fast, we have to have the capacity to make lots of red blood cells to keep up with the speed of that change. So that means we have to have lots of red marrow. Babies, very young children, even up until puberty, you, you still have a lot of red bone marrow. But once you hit what's referred to as plate closure and your skeleton stops growing, the amount of red marrow in your system drops dramatically. Okay, so today, basically all you're doing is replacing the old uh, red blood cells that are wearing out in your system. So every, you know, 280 days or so when your red blood cells die, uh, you have to replace those, and that'll be done with the sparse red marrow that you have in your system. So you just have less because all you're doing is bodily maintenance. Now, you can change that uh, athletically, or if you have a lot of blood loss, you can change it. Um, but that's neither here nor there for our conversation. What I need you to know is that you have very little red marrow today, and I need you to know where you find it, uh, whereas the rest is going to be yellow marrow. Like your, uh, your humerus, the marrow cavity in your humerus, packed with yellow marrow, which is basically fat. Uh, let's talk about some bone cells. So 
All of this is important, but I'm only really going to talk about a few of these. And these are the osteoblasts, the osteocytes, and the osteoclasts. That's really the ones I want you to be concerned with. Uh, osteoblastic cells, and you should know this by now, make bone. Osteoblasts, they make bone. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. They're hanging out in the bone, being bone cells. They also act as sense, uh, to sense stress and strain. So when you're moving around and doing the things your skeleton does, your body is capable of picking up the stretch of your bones to sort of help you to strengthen some areas or weaken others. And then there are, of course, osteoclastic cells. Osteoclastic cells are referred to as bone reabsorbing cells or resorption cells. Uh, the idea is this. When your skeleton is developing or when you break a bone or what have you, uh, osteoblastic cells will come in. They will make bone and make it all around themselves until they're basically trapped in place. Then they mature into sensing stress and strain. They become osteocytes. And then there are osteoclastic cells. Osteoclastic cells do not have the same origin as do osteoblasts and osteocytes. Osteoclastic cells arise in the bone marrow and uh, they're basically white blood cells. Okay, they're fancy white blood cells that come together to uh, allow them to destroy the bony matrix. Basically, this is an osteoclastic cell here. You can see it eating away the bone. This is going to be when your body needs calcium from the skeleton. You'll activate osteoclastic activity, and it'll liberate some calcium that can, be then, uh, can then be used in your um, daily metabolism, if you will. Okay? So osteoblastic cells store calcium in the bones. Osteoclastic cells release calcium from the bones. And uh, that brings up this image here. So what you see is a bunch of what we call osteons, or if you want to be fancy, these are Habertian systems. That's these round structures, as you can see here. All these round structures are osteons or Habertian systems. Now, what you see in the middle, this is a central canal. And then all around this, these dark spots, these are osteocytes. So osteocyte, 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 all sensing stress and strain. And then these central canals uh, being where blood vessels and nervous tissue pass through. And one unit of the bone here is referred to as an osteon or Habertian system. And if I were to come in here and grab a hold of that osteon and pull it out, it would be a big long tube. And if you stood that tube up, it would look like this, okay? So what you see here is a basic osteon. You could pull that thing out and stand it up to see it. And it's made out of individual rings, okay? You can see the rings here. You can see the rings. It's made out of rings. And we need to talk about how these are structured. Now, the osteon will have its individual rings which are called lamellae, all right? They're referred to as the lamellae. It's got these lamellae, and the lamellae are just packed with collagen fiber, okay? Packed with collagen fiber. In fact, the collagen forms these unique spirals in the lamellae. So like this first lamella will have collagen fibers kind of spiraling like this, kind of going in this direction all the way up, the next layer in will have its collagen fibers, the next lamellae, running in the opposite direction. And then the next lamellae in will have its fibers running in the opposite direction. What this does is, and it goes all the way down to the crystalline matrix, okay? What this is going to do is, it's going to make each individual lamellae lay itself down in a patchwork against the next one in. So that if I grab a single osteon and I twist it this way, the fibers that spiral upwards like this will get tight and it won't break. And if I twist it the opposing direction, the offset fibers, which spin in the opposite direction, will get tight and not break. This patchwork system makes the lamellae very, very strong indeed. All right? In torsion. The, all the, um, the calcium and phosphate crystal in there makes it good for tension. Or no, 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 wrong. Good for compression, so you can compress the bone and it's very strong because it's mineralized. And then the collagen in there gives it good torsional strength, so you can twist the bones and they won't fracture. Based off of the way in which the lamellae of these osteons are set up. And again, you can see the central canal here, here with an artery, a vein, 
and a nerve. Ah, okay, so these are all parts of the bone that you need to be very familiar with. The central or Hirschian canal, which we've already talked about, these are all central canals full of uh, arteries, veins, and nerves. Perforating or Volkmann's canals. Perforating canals or Volkmann's canals, they connect side to side within the bone. So like this is a perforating canal or a Volkmann's canal. This is a perforating canal. They connect from side to side. You can see one here. There is a perforating canal right there. Uh, lacunae. Yeah, very often. All right, the lacunae. Lacunae are the openings where you find the osteocytes. So if I go over here, you can see the osteocyte, osteocyte, osteocyte. The lacuna would be the opening where the osteocyte lives. So it's showing you an opening, but the cell inside of there would be an osteocyte. So an osteocyte is the cell that senses stress and strain, and the lacunae is the opening in which it lives. It's its house. And then last but not least, our canaliculi. Canaliculi, as you can see here, are these little spider webby cracks, if you will, between osteocytes. And basically what these do is allow the osteocyte to connect to an adjacent osteocyte so they can exchange, nutri exchange nutrients and waste and nervous transmissions and what have you. Because remember, the osteocytes are in there sensing stress and strain. How are they gonna communicate what they sense to the nervous system? through the canaliculi to the central canal where they can come into contact with a big nerve that can lead out of the bone. So all of this is very important and that is how it is structured. Perfect. That's perfect. All right, the chemical composition of bone is also very important for us. Okay. Let's just shoot from the hip here. <clears throat> your bone is mostly calcium and phosphate crystallization. Minerals, okay? Your bone is mostly minerals. Uh, like 66% or so is mineral. Uh, there will, however, be about 30%, 35% in that neighborhood, which is collagen fiber, organic material. So about 33% organic material, 65% inorganic material. When we say inorganic, we're talking about these mineral salts, uh, calcium and phosphate, and when we say organic, we are mostly talking about collagen fiber. And this is good. Uh, you can take a bone that's fresh from like a butcher or something like that, cut it down the middle, put half of it in muriatic acid, and the other half you chuck it into a muffle furnace, okay? Muffle furnace, what it does is it burns off organic matter, so it removes all the collagen and just leaves behind the minerals. When you take that bone out of the muffle furnace, it's chalk. Okay, it just falls to pieces. When you pull all of the uh, collagen out, the bone just collapses on itself. It's way too flimsy and brittle. All right, the calcium, the mineralization, is just not strong enough to hold it by itself. By comparison, if you place a bone in muriatic acid, it digests away all the minerals and leaves only the collagen behind. And when you take the bone out of the muriatic acid, you just have like a ball of collagen. It's got no structure whatsoever. It's like having a bunch of shoestrings in your hands. What I'm trying to tell you is that you have to have both this mineral component and the organic component for the bones to have their amazing strength that they actually have. Okay, these two work together to provide the bone with a crazy amount of resiliency. The bones are capable of twisting and bending. You just wouldn't believe it because of this organic and inorganic uh, interaction that takes place. Now, I do want to point out uh, sacrificial bonds, which I'm sure is on here someplace. Mm, sacrificial bonds. Okay, uh, sacrificial bonds are very important as well. What these are are weak uh, uh, bondings, if you will, between bits of collagen within the bone. So the bone has collagen in it, and in that collagen there will be little areas of connection between the bits of uh, collagenous material. Think of these as um, energetic release points, okay? Let me use my car as an example here. Here is a race car, and you can see parts just flying everywhere off of this thing. The reason that these cars just break into pieces like that is uh, that when pieces go flying all over the place, um, it actually releases energy from the car itself, and that energy would otherwise be transferred into the driver, which could kill the driver, which would be very bad. So if we can liberate energy by throwing bits elsewhere, 
uh, it decreases the amount of energy that the driver physically experiences, which is great. It's a great idea. Your bones do something similar. Your bones have sacrificial bonds internally that can break to dissipate energy. Let's say that you decide to jump up from where you're sitting right now and go sprinting out and grab something heavy and hoist it up and carry it somewhere else. What's going to happen here is you're going to put a lot of stress on your skeleton when you do that, and it's going to pop a few sacrificial bonds here and there. You may even feel it the next day. You get like shin splints or something. It's like, man, what did I do? I hurt in weird ways, and it's not muscle. Okay, that's damage to the sacrificial bonds in your bones. And those are going to reheal, and they're going to be totally fine. What this does is it keeps the bone from breaking by liberating energy using these sacrificial bonds, which is very important. Oh, man, there's more to say here. But what if you keep stressing those sacrificial bonds? If you keep stressing them and keep stressing them and keep stressing them over and over and over for prolonged periods, you can actually damage the bone itself leading to minor stress fractures and eventually leading the bone to break, okay? Uh, so the sacrificial bonds will keep the bone from breaking in a lot of cases, but if you keep stressing them, they will eventually lead to the bone fracturing as a whole. That works. Um, ossification. So there are two forms of ossification. These are endochondral ossification and intramembranous ossification. Now, endochondral ossification, uh, this is going to take place chondros with cartilage. And then there's intramembranous ossification. Intramembranous ossification takes place within a membrane. You can typically think about this intramembranous ossification as uh, almost entirely the skull. And then endochondral ossification is pretty much everything else. Now, bone growth begins very early, around the second month of uh, fetal development. And your bones will grow in length all the way up until adulthood, early adulthood, uh, between 18 and 23 typically. And then there's bone remodeling. Now bone remodeling can take place anytime. Uh, you can be 80 years old and still be experiencing bone remodeling. So it, it uh, will occur as a lifelong process. And here. All right, uh, endochondral ossification. Now, I invite you to read this. You know, go feel free, read all this. It's really great, you know, good stuff. Uh, I'm just going to kind of explain it to you, and you, there you go, okay? I, th I feel like this is the best way to do it. Uh, <clears throat> first things first. You'll start out with just a, a cartilaginous model of a bone. Like, for instance, this would be hyaline cartilage. And what will happen is your body will grow in, and it will send osteoblasts into place. And these osteoblasts will begin to lay bone down and form what's called a bone collar that would circle around the entire bone. This is a section. You're looking at like a frontal section with bone on either side. The reality is it forms a collar, not unlike my hand around this drink, okay? Forms this bony collar. Now, once this has taken place, the inside of that cartilage is kind of cut off from nutrient supply. So it begins to break down and calcify, and in essence what this does is it leaves behind a whole bunch of nutrients. Your body will then grow in a bud of capillaries that will bear osteoblastic cells. They will use the nutrients of that dying calcified cartilage and start laying bone down all around themselves. And they'll basically form, the, uh, form initially this an interior spongy bone with compact bone as a collar around it. Now. Secondarily, after this has happened, your body will bud in capillaries to each epiphysis individually. Epiphysis, its own bud of uh, ossification. The central diaphysis, its own bud of ossification. And the opposing epiphysis, its own bud of ossification. There will be three ossification centers in a long bone. And when you're born, it's going to look like this. You'll have a little bit of cartilage left over at the top surface. It's going to be articulating cartilage, so your bones can move around and do what your bones do. There will be an epiphyseal plate of cartilage that is referred to as a growth plate. There will be the central diaphysis, which is fully formed, bone collar, interior uh, of spongy bone, an epiphyseal plate, more bone from an ossification center, and then that ending uh, articulating cartilage from the initial part of the skeleton. So two, no, 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 let me rephrase. 
one, two, three individual ossification centers in a given long bone to allow that long bone to grow and develop. Um, yeah, and you can see that. So here is an epiphyseal line. This is a scar left over from uh, the growth plate leading to bone growth. You can see here, this is an adolescent. This person still has growth plates. You can actually measure the length of the growth plate or the height of the growth plate. Engage that with the age of the person and get a good idea of how tall the person will grow. It's pretty fascinating, actually. So you can see the growth plates there physically present. Yeah, man. I'm pretty happy with that. So you can see early development, a little bit of ossification, but this is a membrane. You can see the membrane where the skull is. You can see the ossification beginning to develop in the skull. If you look, it looks like there's like an ossification center here. And you can see the bone is like radiated out. It's almost like pouring oil on top of water. There's a membrane and bone goes, grows through the membrane. Skull bones form via intramembranous ossification. As opposed to here in the long bones, uh, these are going to be formed through endochondral ossification. But what I want you to notice is there's still a lot of cartilage. All right, There's a lot of cartilage in a developing kid. When the kid is born, the skull has fontanelles, these soft spots internally. The skeleton, all the girdles of the body are packed with cartilage. Why? Why would you have so much cartilage in that fetal skeleton at birth? And the answer is very simple because you want the birthing process to be as simple and straightforward and easy as is physically possible. You want the skeleton to be malleable. So when the kid's being delivered through the birth canal, uh, the skeleton can, can bend and flex and do the things that it does. Man, I'll never get a story from my father-in-law. He said that um, his first child, which was my wife, uh, he just kind of held his wife's hand and stared her in the eyes the whole time. He's a simple fella. Okay? Holds her hand, stares her in the eyes, says, you're going to be just fine. But the second kid, my wife's sister, he was like, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to witness the miracle of birth. I'm going to watch this process. So he gets down and he watches and regrets it immediately. He said that when his, uh, when his daughter's head emerged from the birth canal, it was very much cylindrical. Okay? It had a weird shape to it. And he said the first thing he could think was, I'm going to love her no matter what. I'm going to love her no matter what. I'm going to love her no matter what. Uh, because he thought she had some sort of major, major catastrophic problem. Uh, but in reality, the head can change the shape a little bit based off of these fontanelles to allow for easier birthing. Okay? We've got to get the kid out with relative ease, which means we need to have the skeleton be malleable to allow for the birthing process to take place. It's very important for us, very important. It's one of the reasons we don't want uh, a kid going past term because the skeleton gets harder, uh, the body gets larger, and the chance for having a healthy birth, an easier birth, goes down dramatically. All right, intramembranous ossification. Probably should have done this earlier. Uh, the idea with intramembranous ossification is that this happens within a membrane. All right, it happens in a membrane. Uh, what we'll have is a membrane on either side. The body will grow in a bud of uh, capillaries that will bring osteoblasts, and the osteoblasts will fill the area of the membrane with compact, or I'm sorry, spongy bone, and then just spread through the membrane. Okay, you can see that clearly here. There would have been initial ossification. It would have filled that membrane and spread through that membrane. That is what happens with intramembranous ossification, and that's really all I want to say about it at this stage. All right, postnatal bone growth. How does the skeleton develop? So uh, there's interstitial growth and there is appositional growth. Uh, interstitial growth is growth in length of the bone using the epiphyseal plates, which are made out of hyaline cartilage. Uh, this will happen for about the first 18 years of females and the first 21 years of males. And then there is appositional growth. <clears throat> appositional growth can happen anytime. You could be 40 years old and experience appositional growth. And that is growth in width or thickness, toughness of the bone can change dramatically over your life cycle. Uh, what do I want to say here? Okay, so we're getting at the epiphyseal plates. Now, there are zones in the epiphyseal plate that you need to be familiar with. 
These are the resting zone, the proliferative zone, the hypertrophic zone, uh, the calcification zone, and the ossification zone. They look like this. So if we come in here and we pull this epiphyseal plate out and look at it, it would look like this. Here's the epiphyseal plate. It would be one complete unit. The center would be there. The center is here. And you can see what the epiphyseal plate looks like from this image. <coughs> you need to be familiar with this as a concept. All right, here we go. Bunch of people in the hall. Moving on. There is a zone of reserve cartilage. When you're born, you have piles of reserve cartilage in your epiphyseal plates that will eventually develop into parts of long bones, okay? So we have this zone of reserve cartilage that is followed by a zone of proliferation. Proliferation means to increase in number. This is where the cartilage cells have gone mitotic. Okay, they're mitotic. They're dividing here. And when they divide, one cell that's this big becomes two cells that are really small. So what do you have to do? The next zone is the zone of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy means to grow larger. <clears throat> so the cells are here resting, then they divide, they're small, then they have to get bigger. That's the zone of hypertrophy. And when they get bigger, that makes your bones get longer. Now, what comes next? A zone of calcification. All these long white lines, these are calcium crystals. The zone of calcification, you take these cells that have grown and gotten larger, and you calcify them. And then last but not least, the zone of bone deposition. What you'll do is you'll bring in osteoblastic cells, they use the cartilage, they use the calcium to build bone and uh, make it part of your skeleton. So eventually, <clears throat> the reserve cartilage will be no more, and you'll only have proliferative cells. Then the proliferative cells will be no more, and you'll only have hypertrophic cells. And then once the hypertrophic cells are no more, you'll only have calcifying cartilage. And then once all of that is gone, you only have bone, and you experience plate closure. So this growth plate will get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until the epiphysis meets the diaphysis. They fuse together and the bone can grow no larger. That's how you get it. Let me rephrase. That's how you attain height. Okay? By having these cells slowly develop and get bigger and then calcify and then turn to bone, the bone grows longer. Uh, as opposed to appositional growth. Appositional, appositional growth is growth in width. The idea is as the bone gets longer, it must also get thicker, and uh, that's what's happening here. You're, you're seeing it in real time. So the bone started out very thin, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it responds to the place, uh, stresses we place upon it. Basically, when you stress your bones, they get thicker. Okay, if you don't stress your bones, they get thinner. They respond not unlike your skin and tanning. Okay? The reason that you produce melanin in your skin is a result of UV radiation hitting your skin surface. The body's like, oh man, all this UV, we better take care of it, make more melanin. It's the same concept here. Uh, when you stretch your bones, the body's like, oh man, we're stressing out the bones, we better make them tougher. So you go through appositional growth. As you get older, your bones will thicken and become overall more tough and more sturdy, uh, but still not too heavy because they're hollow and the walls are not that thick. Yeah, that's appositional growth. I'm totally down with that. That's a good way to look at it. Now, we should probably have a little bit of a conversation on hormones as well. There are a variety of hormones that are very, very important to the way in which our skeleton develops. These are growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and then the sex hormones be that testosterone or estrogen, steroid hormones. Now, growth hormone runs the show here. Okay, let me not play games. Growth hormone is in control. Uh, growth hormone is what triggers your growth for the most part, what allows you to grow larger. I've seen crazy things done with growth hormone in my life. It is very, very powerful. Uh, there was a young man that was in one of my classes, um, actually in my grade, I guess, during middle school, and he was very small, and he would never get bigger uh, until he was in like seventh or eighth grade, well, about seventh grade, I guess, sixth or seventh. Uh, his parents took him to a doctor. It turns out his body wasn't making growth hormone. He started getting shots of growth hormone, and the kid was like 6'2 in a year and a half, two years. It was crazy. It's an amazing hormone, and what it does is it stimulates epiphyseal plate growth, okay? Growth hormone stimulates epiphyseal plate activity. Very important. 
thyroid hormone just kind of plays some games with growth hormone. It regulates it to some degree. Uh, and then there's a, a testosterone and estrogen. You can take a five-year-old and x-ray them, and you really can't tell the difference between a male and a female. They're very similar. Uh, but once you hit you know, your uh, teens, you go through puberty, uh, the skeleton starts to really change. Like the way the brow structure is, the jawline, uh, ear structures even, the hands, especially the pelvis. The pelvis really changes dramatically as a response to exposure to either testosterone or estrogen. This derives what we refer to as secondary sexual characteristics based off of male and female. And uh, the hormones really drive these variations. And worthy of mention here is that any excesses or deficits of these can dramatically change things. What you see here is one of the world's tallest men and one of the world's shortest men. These are both fully grown adults. Uh, this uh, gentleman here, I believe, had pituitary dwarfism. This is a situation where the pituitary gland does not make appropriate amounts, or any in some cases, growth hormones, so the guy never attained size. He reached full plate closure, and he's you know very short, very very short indeed. By comparison to this gentleman here, uh, which is a uh, person who has gigantism. Gigantism is where the pituitary gland just cranks out growth hormone from an early age, and it continues crank it continues cranking out growth hormone, causing more and more cartilage to develop, and leading to the attaining of an extraordinary height. He will grow taller till the day he dies, uh, which will probably be in his 40s. Uh, these folks tend not to live very long. The heart can't take it. And that brings up an interesting picture set. Uh, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger on the set of Conan the Barbarian. And Arnold is 6'2", 6'3". He's a big old boy. That is Wilt Chamberlain, professional basketball player, probably the best that ever lived. And uh, Wilt was over seven foot, as I recall. And here is the uh, most widely known sports figure in modern history. This is Andre the Giant. Andre had gigantism. His facial features, his hands, his body structure is not unlike the unique facial features and hands of the gentleman to the left. Well, we almost made it. My battery died. Let's talk about Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, so Wilt Chamberlain uh, is just genetically tall. So he looked completely normal when he was 12 or 13. Then he probably shot up like a crazy person, growing very tall, very fast. And then he had plate closure in his early 20s. And he never grew taller again. If you look at his facial features, look at his hands, the way his body is structured, it doesn't look unlike any other person you've ever seen before. If Wilt Chamberlain was out the window and a good distance from you right now, you might realize that he was kind of a tall, lanky guy, but you wouldn't see anything physically wrong. Like, look at, uh, look at Arnold's brow line. I'm sorry, Arnold. Look at Andre's brow line. Look at his hands. Look how big this guy's hands are. That's because anywhere there's cartilage, it just grows out of control. But then look at Wilt Chamberlain. His physical features are completely normal. And the reason is he's just genetically tall. This isn't any kind of uh, uh, like a pituitary tumor or anything that would drive their conditions. No, he's just genetically tall, just as some people are genetically short. Okay. Uh, I've seen people that are, you know, four foot less and they're just genetically short. It's just random chance. Okay. Random chance. There's a lot of people in the middle and there's some that are very tall and some that are very short. And uh, that's how this works. That's how this works. And let's see here. What do we want to say? Bone recycling. Yeah, we can talk about this. So um, you recycle about 5 to 7% of your bone mass every week. If you do the math on this, what it works out to is that you completely replace your spongy bone about every three to four years. And your compact bone is replaced on about a 10-year cycle. Uh, the reason that we do this is if bone gets old, it sort of... Uh, crystallizes in an unfortunate way and leads to it being very brittle and it fractures quite easily. So we have to constantly remodel our bones through osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity to keep them functional, okay, so that they don't become brittle. It's very important. Uh, the hormones which drive this are parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and serotonin, okay. Parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium levels. And this is going to be through osteoclastic activity. 
So parathyroid hormone activates osteoclasts to break down bone, which mobilizes calcium out into the bloodstream. By comparison, calcitonin lowers blood calcium levels by activating osteoblastic cells. So activating osteoblasts to put bone, or I'm sorry, to put calcium into the skeleton. And uh, then we think serotonin might also play a role here. Serotonin is thought of as making us feel good. Uh, there has been some evidence that people that are on long-term mood enhancers, like Prozac, for example, uh, might potentially have slightly lower bone mass. And we think that's because serotonin might interfere with osteoblastic activity, making it a little harder for your body to store calcium. Uh, and then and last, let's do last but not least for this portion of the lecture, there is Wolf's Law. And this is so important, folks, so important. Wolf's Law states that bone growth and remodeling takes place in response to the demands placed upon the skeleton. That is to say that your skeleton responds to the stresses placed upon it. This lady here is a tennis player, right-handed. If you look at the humerus on her serving arm that does most of the work, that bone is way thicker than the bone on the opposing side that doesn't see all the stress, okay? Your skeleton will respond to the stresses placed upon it. If we all quit school right now, went and got an MRI and had our bone densities measured, looking at the thickness, and then we went and all of us became hardcore bodybuilders for a year. At the end of that year, one, we'd be in great shape and just jacked. But two, we could go back and get another MRI done. And guess what? You can see a variation in your skeleton in the way it appears. It's going to look distinctly different. Because Wolf's Law states that your skeleton responds to the stresses placed upon it. If you do a job that deals with a lot of manual labor, and you have friends that do jobs that have no manual labor, your skeletal density will be different because your skeleton responds to the stresses placed upon it. Not unlike, as I said previously, the way that your skin responds to sunlight by producing melanin, your skeleton responds to stress by producing more bone. And uh, I'm going to say that's a nice place to stop. So we're going to pick it up on fracture classifications the next time through. This is going to be a two-parter. Uh, so let's stop here, and we'll continue on in a little while. Thanks.